cc's in spinal fluid. If you overdrain that, you can get acute subdural. And what happens is the, the, the brain has spinal fluid and it's, it has this uh, tension. And so the brain is floating on spinal fluid. If you drain, if you drain all the spinal fluid, the brain collapses. And there's brains that attach from the skull. They're called bridging veins to the brain. And these break off. And then you have an acute subdural hematoma. So can a little, you know, someone was in a pain, or even a person was cleaning the bed. You're like, oh, they pressed it up to get under. We have to keep an eye on that. But do you normally write orders for physical therapy if someone had one of those? I, uh, we do, and, and the reason is some of these patients, for instance, who have ICP, uh, we don't want them to get spastic. We want them to start working on the legs and everything. Mm -hmm. That's important to start working on their body, too. Um, some patients who are, and I'll talk about pentobarcoma later, pentobarcoma, you keep these patients an extra week paralyzed. But there you also want to continue working with their body, range of motion, other activity. But then you have to make sure that you don't move the height of the bed. Okay? You can work with anybody, and even if, if you just transiently clamp it, move the patient up, re-scoot him, and open it back up to a, a zero level, it's fine. You can continue working with patients. I've had patients who have uh, very complex hydrocephalus who are walking, talking with ventriculostomies. And yes, we want them to walk around, to be active, because it decreases the DVTs, decreases the, the risk of their muscle atrophy and everything. So yes, you want to continue work. Thank you. And, and again, um, keeping it level is very important. Um, is, is that why we're getting lots of orders when we do have this to do the close for an hour and then go in and zero and then open it and drain and then close it again? Is, and, that, and, is that the idea behind that? And um, again, everybody does it differently. Um, I, I'm, I do it where the reason we sometimes ask you to keep it clamped and open it every hour, for instance, if someone had a spinal fluid leak, I want you to drain 10 cc's an hour close it back up. So why, so we're decreasing the pressure, transmural pressure, so CSF leak doesn't leak through the hole, it leaks out through the catheter, mm -hmm. okay? So depending on why we're using this, if we're using it for ICP in this patient, I'll, I'll, I can, I usually write clamp when you're doing anything. When you're moving the patient or anything, and then once you zero and readjust, you can open it back and keep it at something, okay? At 15, I usually like 15 or 12, a magic number that whoever's comfortable with. Okay, but if you clamp it and open it and clamp it and open it, that's where did I clamp it? Did I open it? It's always better to keep it monitored and drain. Okay, if you clamp it and then you oh ICP is now shut up to 50. Well, that's something we could have prevented by leaving it open to spawn fluid to leak out. And everybody hates these. I, don't know why. I think they're great. Um, ventriculostomy uh, catheter, um, this is going into the brain over here, this is the catheter that comes in, and goes around here, and then comes into the chamber. Important thing about the, the ventriculostomy catheter, this chamber has an air seal. If you lay this on the bed, this air seal gets wet, and it doesn't drain. So whenever there's a transport of a patient or anything, you have to make sure that you don't lay these flat. You're supposed to keep them standing up. If you're going to do anything, you have to make sure that you're going to change the angle or anything or drain the bag, that the catheter is clamped down here, going in from the brain, that this is drained out so there's no more fluid in here. Because if this fluid gets up here, it, dec it decreases the air vent, and it's like a siphon. If there's no air, nothing's moving. If air's coming in, it can be drained. So it's important never to lay these flat. And if it, by accident it lays flat, let us know. Sometimes we can do is just change out the back, unplug it, get a new one, and that's it. But if, it, if we lay it flat, and then you say, well, nothing's drained for two hours, well, most likely it's because it got wet and the air vent is not working. Then one thing I will tell you is, when you're monitoring the, 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 the spinal fluid, I would tell you, measure it always from here, never from the bag. Um, whenever you're doing uh, every hour, count what you're doing and document and then drain it. So you never have, oh, how much did we have? Because it depends on the output, how much it's putting out. If someone has hydrocephalus, I want to know exactly the output of the ventricle catheter. 
to see if somebody's shot. Or not. Um, and, and it's much easier to count 10 cc's than when a full shift that is full to say, okay, now it's 30 and we'll dump it. Because when it gets full, black is up there. What's up with that? Okay. Um, management of ICP. Um, other things that we work on is you know, things that we all can mo modify. Once we start getting into medications, the osmotic diuretics, mannitol is the one that we use the most. And it's an osmotic diuretic that everybody overuses. Um, everybody says, oh, the patient came in, low GCS, we gave him mannitol. You're treating what? Um, in order for you to properly treat someone, you have to have an ICP monitor to be able to say, the ICP is elevated, now I'll use mannitol. Can you use mannitol as rescue? If I have a blown pupil, I'm trying to figure out, yes. But if, if you have someone who is talking and you know saying what's wrong, and so say, oh, subdural, let's give me mannitol, you're going to make it worse because you're going to shrink the brain, increase the space for the subdural to get larger. So mannitol, the best way to use it is with an ICP monitor and also using serum osmos. What happens if the serum osmolarity climbs up to 340, 350? Then what happens is the blood brain barrier stops working. Water starts leaking. So what happens is instead of you helping the brain by drawing it, water will start going across and you will cause more edema. So this is a cutoff. Whenever you see mannitol hold for systolic blood pressure less than 110 or 100. And why? Because then mannitol will drop the blood pressure, drop the map, if you don't want that, or if the osmos are greater than 320. Because then what happens is the, the capillaries start leaking, causes more edema. Uh, I, I did not, I forgot to put this, 3% uh, is a uh, 3% uh, saline, is something that's being used, and it's very good. They've used it in, uh, in uh, recent wars, and they're actually using up to 5%. And you can use 5%, and your cutoff is uh, serum sodium of 160. Um, and it works very well. The problem is if you start using mannitol on 3%, then your osmol shoot up, shoot up, and also your sodium shoots up, and then you're stuck. So use one or use the other, but when you start using the combination of both, that's when you start getting into trouble. Um, I like 3%. Um, I like keeping mannitol as my almost backup. Um, moderate hyperventilation, and I'll say this, this is not what you want to do anymore. You want to keep them normal cap. But again, if this is, you can consider this if the patient is, the uh, ICP is climbing, it's going to the 50s, not responsive, bag him a little bit, drop the PCO2 a little bit, see how he's doing, but don't continuously do it. Don't do it more than 20 minutes unless you're going to the OR. Then the last thing we can say, well, let's put this patient in a pentobar coma. Well, pentobar coma is really the last resort that we have to treat ICPs, other than doing a hemicraniectomy. And hemicraniectomies in trauma is something that you can do, and it also depends on the patient's age, salvageability, how the brain looks. Hemicraniectomy is the easiest procedure to do, but then what happens is you have all these patients that have poor outcomes just taking up space. I was wondering why we don't just do that. I was going to ask that question, actually. Hemicraniectomies are something that, in younger patients, they do great. Uh, someone who is 18, 24, hemicraniectomy, their outcomes are better than if you do it in, in older patients. Why? Brain brain plasticity, the brain function in younger patients improves better than older patients. And I've, I've been called many times, I have an 80 year old person who's got this big stroke, can I do a hemicraniectomy? Left side of the hemisphere, what, out, what outcomes, what, 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 what do we expect to get? Do we want to have someone who's functional? And again, you always want to go with patient's wishes and everything, but that's where we have to say, it's futile. There's no indication for this. So you're going to do this surgery, and you're going to be someone who has no quality of life. Okay. Um, Pentobarb coma, and pentobarb coma, I use it more for younger patients, um, for pediatric patients, and I try to use pentobarb coma even after a craniectomy. And, and that's kind of like last-ditch effort, because what happens if you give someone pentobarb 
you have to give these loading doses, you have to put in on burst suppression with EEG, and you have to give in boluses and boluses. A half-life of pentobarb is very long. If you put someone in a pentobarb coma, you have to wait three to four days to try and see how they're waking up. Mm -hmm. Then you have to check levels. And pentobarb coma, if you're trying to figure out someone's brain dead, you have to wait until the pentobarb levels go within therapeutic range so you can declare someone brain dead. But pentobarb coma outcomes aren't really that great. But again, it's one of the things that we can do. And, and here, it's uh, again, the decreased mortality has not been shown to improve neurologic outcome. It does help with ICP. And when you give pentobarb coma, the ACP drops nicely. But then when you stop the ACP, it climbs up. Okay. Um, this is the only thing do not use. Steroids do not. That is a standard of care. Mm -hmm. No steroids in head injuries. Everything else, you can go in. Steroids, loss of pain. Loss of head what injury. about if they have a spinal cord injury? But that's different. Spinal cord injury. And, and, and one of the topics I wanted to talk about is spinal cord injury. Spinal cord injury, the use of steroids is, yeah, it is not a standard of care. It is one of the recommendations. What happens when you use spinal cord, uh, and someone has spinal cord injury and use steroids, there is an improvement of one to two levels of function. For instance, if you have a C6 quad, you could pro a C4, probably you could get to C6. It's important for almost someone who's got a respiratory drug. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about someone's a T5, T6, T7, you have to consider benefits and risks. The, the solumedrol protocol is a massive dose of steroids. Right. A higher morbidity and complications so they use steroids. Why do I give them? Because there's nothing else to do. Right. Is it the best for the patient? I don't think it really makes any difference. Mm -hmm. Except for the C4, a paraplegic, that might have respiratory drive versus it being on the ventilator. Oh. Everybody else, there's really no proof. There's proof on dogs, and there's a lot of studies saying it was great on dogs, but more information came out. Most patients have more complications, and pneumonia, oh. acute sores, other things that are associated with steroids. Mm -hmm. For the head, if it's just an isolated head injury, do not use steroids. You know, they used to do Depidon, that's what yes, you're about. don't. No, no. no steroids. No Decatron, no salumedrol, steroids and head injuries will kill your patient. But after surgery, that's, I mean, like, for like but, a brain tumor. But it's different. Brain so tumor. you're talking trauma. Uh, you, there's different types of edema. Cytotoxic edema and versus, for instance, uh, uh, edema secondary from trauma. Uh, when you have a tumor, you have edema that's mesogenic, that's coming from, you can do a resection, more blood flow came in. Yes. In tumors, a decadron helps. Trauma, it does not. Okay. So this is, of all the things that I tell you, this is the number one don't. Okay. Prophylactic anticonvulsants. Um, people say yes. People say no. Um, I always say, if I can give someone, and this is, uh, I'm talking about uh, some of these test uh, studies were done when dilantin. Dilantin, you have to get blood levels. You have to correct with albumin, adjust levels big pain. Now with Kepra came out IV, just two doses, you don't have to follow levels. Much easier to manage. Why I like using at least for temporal load, and, and this is, again, there's no outcomes proved, but in patients who have a high risk, temporal lobe contusions, subdural hematomas have a high risk of having post-traumatic seizures. So in these patients, I like using Kepra for seven days. If someone had a with the seizure, then you have to do at least, uh, you know, there's one study that said one month, others said three months. I always do is put them on care profile with neurology and we can take them off. Because you have to make sure that they are not having focus And then uh, I'll just finish up with this. Um, it's very important that we know what sort of patients have a disease and what sort of disease has a patient. Um, sometimes we get cut up and say, oh, the, the head injury, the spine. Okay. You guys don't do it, but both doctors do. <laughs> References. Um, uh, this is the one that I've been quoting the most, the Guidelines for Management of TBI. And this is the third edition, edition uh, from the Trauma Foundation. And uh, these, other, these are older. What? Okay.
What's your thought on um, like decreasing stimulation for 